place, place to, be. to be is living, living free, living, living free in Tennessee. Tennessee. Welcome to Living Free in Tennessee, where we talk about building the life you choose on your terms. Today is Monday, January 29th, 2024, and this is episode 854 of Living Free in Tennessee. And if you heard a funny introduction, it's because I hit the wrong button <laughs> at the very beginning. So I thought we'd try the music again today. The reason I stopped doing it is it was not capturing all of the introduction the last couple times I did it. Of course, those of you in the live stream, if you want to get questions in or whatever, put the first like comments, put the first thing in all caps, and I will mark them for answering later. Today, I'm going to talk about, it's all about me today. I'm going to talk about how I make decisions on what to do and what not to do. And it's on a micro level rather than on a big picture level. And I think it's important to make purposeful decisions, even on the smallest of things, because if you have a means by which to make quick decisions about little things, then you know that you have your big picture vision in, in place. And that makes everything easier in your whole life. Okay. And that's, you know, that kind of goes back to the thing I've talked about before. It takes me 60 to 90 seconds to unload my dishwasher. So why not just go for it? Every time you see that the dishwasher is full, it's like 90 seconds. What's that going to change in your day? Even if you're running behind, another 60 seconds is not going to kill you. But then sometimes it, you know, like if you stack up 15 of those things, well, that's a wholly different story. And that's why you want to have the means by which to make those kinds of decisions. Before I jump into that, though, I want to talk about our featured event of today's show, and it is the Self-Reliance Festival in Camden, Tennessee. It's April 6th and 7th, and the early bird tickets are up. $95 includes camping and parking. That's over at selfreliancefestival.com. Also want to thank our two sponsors of today's show. The first sponsor is agoristaxadvice.com. Agoristaxadvice.com is in his prime season right now, I'm sure, because everybody's starting to think about Taxes, everybody's favorite word. Well, he can help you analyze how your businesses are structured, figure out what you can take write-offs on, and then know how to track them well and know any risks associated with them. I think it's a great service. You keep more of your money in your pocket, which you should. You should be utilizing the tax code to the fullest extent that you can to keep more money in your pocket. Find out more at agoristaxadvice.com forward slash LFTN. If you go there, you can sign up for his email list, which I find really helpful because he sends a weekly digestible email just about something tax code related. Our second sponsor of today's show is EMP Shield, empshield.com. We have a coupon code, LFTN, gives you $50 off a device, and it gives you whole house protection or whole car protection or whole solar system protection against surges, electrical sorts of things. Yes, an EMP pulse. All of those things, what'll happen is it'll fry that device and not your other devices on the other side of, of its protection, which is kind of a cool thing. It's actually when I compare it to other surge protectors, less expensive, and they have what they call like the wall of fame in the factory where they have all these devices that got blown up. If for some reason their device doesn't save you from, say, lightning striking the the transistor or the transistor is the wrong word. La, 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 la. I can't think of the word. Anyway, hitting the transformer. Wow. It's like I forgot the 80s and the transformers and I don't know what my problem was. Anyway, hitting the transformer outside your house, wouldn't you rather fry something that cost you like 350 bucks than all of your appliances, your TV, your computer, anything that was plugged in? I always bring that one up because that actually happened to somebody down the road for me. In fact, that transformer has been hit twice in the 17 years that I've been here. So we have them here. That's empshield.com. Coupon code LFTN to get $50 off. Finally, our live stream schedule this week is, is, of course, like right now. And then Tuesday at 1230, I'll be live on our Tuesday Live with John Willis. And we have Matthew Sersley from Agris Tax Advice on for that one because the last day of January is a really good time to talk to him. So He'll be on that day, Wednesday at 2 p.m. We're going to talk about 
the Amazon Influencer Program. Have you heard about that? The Amazon Influencer Program is another way to make affiliate income, but you're making videos about products that you get on Amazon. And it's something that's relatively new. Brian from the Lots Project will be on because he's been experimenting with it for about, I don't know, three, four weeks now. And he's learned a lot. He thought he'd just talk to you about what that is all about. And then, of course, Friday, 930 a.m. Central Time, we'll do Homestead Happenings with Tactical Redneck from here. And he and I will just go over what's up on the homestead. With that, it's time for our first segment of today's show, and that's Tales from the Prepper Pantry. This is where we talk about storing what you use and using what you store. And we are in the final three. You know what that means, right? Do you guys like my sign? I'm not quite done with it because it's got a weird glare, but we're working on it. I've been trying to figure out how to backlight that thing against the black wall so you can actually see my logo. Anyway. Um, we are in the last three days of the pantry challenge. January is the second time I've ever done this. The first one I did was in July, years ago. I think it was July 2020 probably, but it might have been 2019 or 2018. I was like, what happens if we don't go to the grocery store at all? You can only like get your stuff from farms, from your pantry, your normal subscriptions are okay, but basically you're testing, do I really store what I use and use what I store? And that month, I had this, some of the same problems I had this month, which is the cheese and milk problem. But we made it. And I actually learned something this month that's pretty cool. I'll share with you in a bit. We are in the final three days, which means fresh food or fresh vegetables is really not around, except for the stuff I'm growing. And luckily, I have enough for one more fresh greens meal. And that is tonight, we're having taco salad. And the reason that's kind of a an urgent thing for me is that taco salad is one of my go-tos for a quick meal on a day when we're like busy from the time we get up until the time we go to bed. Mondays are choir days. So I got to get my rear end out the door by like five o'clock or I got to eat at five and get my door out by my rear out the door by about five 30 to get to my rehearsal by seven. And if I don't do that right, then what has happened in the past is I go to a restaurant, like I'll, I'll like breeze through the Chinese buffet and get a plate and, and like snarf it and then hit practice. Well, I can't do that today because I'm still in the pantry challenge. And one of the things you're not allowed to do is go to a restaurant. So we are in the final three. I managed to glean enough Swiss chard and other things to be able to do taco salad. I pre-cooked the taco salad at, well, the taco meat for the taco salad at lunch so I can just reheat it tonight and get it done quick. And whew, I actually don't mind going out to eat once in a while next month. I'll probably look forward to that again. I just told Tactical, I said, I think I'm going to actually want to go out and eat sometime in February. So we'll see if that's to Mexican food at the marina or like to Indian food in Cookville or whatever. I always like a sushi dinner too. So lots of different options there. I'm really thankful that the aquaponics system is here. The aquaponics system went in the first spring workshop I ever had. And the, despite the fact we were at four degrees below zero, I was rotating water through the aquaponics system that was about 36 degrees. And I had the beds covered and my Swiss chard is still alive and my green onions are still alive. So I'm pretty pleased with how that was resilient through the freeze. And that's the only reason I'm able to do taco salad tonight. Otherwise it would have been like a pile of taco meat over cooked green beans from the can. Cause I have canned green beans right now. That's about all I've got. There was some flooding in the prepper pantry this week. Nothing was hurt because I don't have anything on the, the ground there. Uh, but that is a reminder, if you have something like I do in your prepper pantry where it, it's kind of like a basement or it's exposed to maybe flooding, think about how you're storing stuff because when you have stuff flush on the ground and you get flooding, you get mold under there if you don't pull everything out and get everything all dried out. And we got that after the snow. We had like inches of rain following the snow. So we just had a whole lot of moisture and that came up in the one corner of the prepper pantry where Tactical knows he needs to take a rock chisel to the um, to the, the the stone on the back side of my house because my house is built into a hillside for those of you who don't know. And when they put it in, they did not make sure the drainage was handled. And so there's this place where like the the foundational stone or rock upon which we are built, 
the rock actually juts up. It's like an, it's an and 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 um, the water is flowing downhill and then hits that up ledge, and then it was going under my house. Well, we stopped it going under my house, but there's a second up ledge where it will make if it gets like a lot of water, it'll make it go into the prepper pantry. So it's eventually we'll get that done. I'm hoping that'll be a this year thing that that gets done. So just think about that. And it's always nice to have things not in cardboard boxes. That's the other thing is if you have flooding and you have cardboard boxes, they protect 0%, maybe 0.5%. I am running into some mason jar storage challenges without any kitchen cabinets, except for a couple of upper cabinets. I don't have any lowers. It's harder for me to store all because I store all of my herbal remedies and teas and canned foods. And like, I've just sort of used mason jars for that because they're a uniform thing. I have them. They're easy to get my hands on. They're glass. I can count on them. Well, the thing is you need shelves or something for them. And without shelves, I have bins of mason jars of teas around. And I'm trying to figure out what I want to do in order to store those better. I do have cardboard boxes, speaking of cardboard boxes, that they can go into, but then I can't see them. And so then I have to have a better rotation method for, because in particular, this is for the teas and the dried herbs. I need a better rotation method for that if I'm going to have that. And then I have one lower cabinet over by my coffee station where I can put them, but things get lost in the dark. So I'm kind of missing the ability to have more shelving here. And I will probably resolve that by putting in some mason jar storage systems. And I'm kind of thinking stuff that, that like rotates out. So it's not just a couple of jars, but I can actually pull out and see multiple jars in a row. I'll keep you guys posted as I come up with a solution. It's going to, if I do this, it will yield some wonderful pantry porn photos. So, and we all love pantry porn photos, you know, Okay. The use it up versus fill it up time. We are, we are firmly in a use it up time. And when you think about pantries, it, it has seasons and, and different seasons of the year mean that you're either putting things into it for later use, or you're using the things in it because, well, they aren't coming off the land or they're not, you know, it's not their season. And we are firmly in use it up, but we are going to be getting ready for the fill it up time again. And that means I'm starting to look at how many jars of whatnot have I used? Because I'll start getting lettuces probably in March, assuming everything goes well with the growing. And then greens and spring greens come on. And then next thing you know, you're getting your back like fully into the all the garden vegetables again. And I have a lot of canned goods right now. And I have refined what we store over the years based on what we eat. But it seems to me like maybe we are not eating as many canned vegetables as we used to. And that doesn't mean I'm buying something at the store. It's just I think we're just eating more meat. So I don't know. I have a good 50 jars of green beans left. I have more bone broth than I can. That's actually probably part of my source problem is I have more than 60 jars of canned bone broth. I've stopped canning bone broth because we have so much and I just don't use it that much. Like we're to the point where every day I drink a cup of bone broth and I hand it to tactical just to get through the bone broth. And that is just keeping up with the bone broth we make off the bones we're producing on a regular basis just by eating food. So I'm not even getting into the canned stuff. And I went that direction rather than using it up and like refilling it with new because Bone broth will store for a while. And because then I'm not wasting the energy on canning more when I don't have to, because it's already canned. So we <laughs> it's just one of those things that I never thought would be a problem because there were years where I didn't have enough bone broth in the past. And now it's like tons and tons of bone broth. I've got a question in that fits entails for the prepping pantry. So I'll take it now. And that's, can you talk about how to make simple bone broth from 30 day reviews? I have pork bones I need to make broth with. Well, the question I have for you about those pork bones is, are they raw or not? So I'm going to assume they're raw because you can cut out step one if you want to. I find the best way to make bone broth. This is not the way I make it every time, but the best way is to roast the bones first. You just toss them in the oven. I go at 350 degrees for about 25 minutes. 
and you just have them on cookie sheets and then you pour all that and anything that dripped off them because you'll get like fat cooking off of there and whatnot. You then put them into a big stock pot. I'm going to go with like, you don't have special equipment, dude. Oh, and you said they're cooked. So, well, then you don't have to roast them. If they're still raw, you want to roast them. Well, it's just a flavor difference. If you don't roast them, it still tastes good. To that, to a stock pot, I'll add one onion and then any other vegetable bits I've put aside in my in my freezer. A lot of people like to add parsley and carrots for flavor. Pretty much here, anything goes. The one thing that's important to me is that onion, if I have it. And if I don't have it, I'll throw green onions in. If I don't have that, when I cut my onions up, I keep onion bits in the bag with the bones. Like the bone broth I made this week, because I only have two onions left right now. Scratch that one and a half because I use some in the taco meat for the pantry challenge. Um, I've been keeping all my skins and ends of onions that don't have soil on them and putting them in the bag with the bones and then boiling those with the bone broth. So then you simmer that for as long as you want. And if you're simmering it at like a rolling boil, that's not a simmer. I mean, like a real light, low simmer. I like to go 12 to 24 hours. Sometimes I go 48 hours if I have um, a particularly lar like large bones versus little bones. And then once that's done, you cool it down enough that you can handle it, but don't let it get all the way cold. And then I strain it. I pour it through a strainer and then I pour it into another pot that will fit in my fridge and I put it in my fridge. And what usually happens is I get this puck of animal fat on the top and I take that puck, you know, like it overnight or whatever in the fridge and then the, take the puck off. I put that aside and I use that instead of cooking oil. Other people toss it. I think that's a waste of animal fat. So we use it instead. I haven't had to buy oil in two years because I always have enough of other fat sources to saute things in, to stir fry things in. And I just do not use any seed oils of any kind in my cooking anymore. So we do that. And then if I have a lot of fat, I will put it in smaller amounts in the freezer. And something I've learned that works really well for that is to um, put it, they make small, they make like packages of six small little plastic Tupperwares at the Dollar Tree for $1.25 because it's the $1.25 tree now. And I'll pour it into that. And then you just take one of those out at a time as you need it. Or you can pour it in small containers. Or I haven't tried ice cube trays, but I'd totally be willing to try ice cube, cube trays for that. Anyway, freeze it and then use that for cooking. The bone broth itself, I will then pour into jars and can. I will salt it to taste after it's cooked. Um, I actually can it without salt and I salt it to taste on the way out of the jar or I'll store it in my fridge for up to two weeks. Depending, I mean, like you can smell when it goes bad. Um, what I don't do is the final step that a lot of people do, which is to pour it through a finer strainer or a coffee filter to get any little chunks out. I don't mind that there are chunks there, uh, but if you want a really clear broth, then you want to pour it through a coffee filter and it will strain any little bits of, um, is any little bits of like meat or whatnot that's in there. And how long can bone broth freeze? Uh, probably a couple of years. Uh, I've, I've never kept it in the freezer longer than a couple of years because usually by that time that it's in the freezer for that long, I need the space. So then I have to use it up. So that's actually why I started canning it because I thought, why, why waste space in my freezer for bone broth? So that's everything about bone broth. Thank you for the question. I am going to be diving into some of my canned meats this week because I do canning webinars. And one of the things that I've taught people to can is beef and chicken and other meats. And every time I do this, I do a demo and I end up with like 12 jars of canned meat. And I find that cooking chicken stew from home canned chicken is way better than from a, like from your chicken. Like having gone through bone in canning process takes out more flavors out of the bones, I think. It makes it really fast to make a chicken stew, which we like to use when people get, you know, the flu around here or when we feel like we're craving chicken stew. 
Also, I might sneeze here in a second, so we should totally get ready to mute that. Mm, nope, not yet. Okay, so I'll, I've got a bunch of canned beef from the beef webinar, and I will we'll be doing more. And it's been about a year and a half since I canned it, so it's time to use it up because I like to use it within two years. So I'll be doing that. And then on the homegrown cooking episodes that, that we're doing, I will just show you how I'm using it, and we'll do taste tests, and I'll share the recipes. And if you didn't know, because Don Gorham let the cat out of the bag this week, uh, we've started recording a show called Homegrown Cooking, where she and I are working together and just cooking different cuts of meat nose to tail. We started with steaks last week. I don't know when the videos will launch for that, but we had some pretty funny outtakes and she, she shared some pictures of that. And then she was worried because I was like, oh, you let the cat out of the bag. I was like, no, it's fine. I was going to let the cat out of the bag anyway. So... Uh, we're just, we're getting ready to launch that. And I will probably run some videos here, but we, I actually have another YouTube channel called Homegrown Cooking and it's at Homegrown Cooking, YouTube forward slash at Homegrown Cooking. That's, that's the channel. So I just thought it'd be fun to laser focus in on that topic and, and base it around specifically educational to food and food preparation. So that's, that's the deal. Do you plan to harvest more or less meat this year? Right now, well, I'm going to harvest as much meat as we produce. And will I keep it? It's probably the bigger question because I may end up selling it. We, we harvested six sheep last year. And so we still have a lot of lamb meat, although I'm trucking through that pretty fast. And we also got two cows. Yep. I have two cows here and I'm pretty sure we're not going to eat all two of the cows this year, but I had a chance to get that second cow and I know how good the meat is from that farmer. So I just grabbed it with the idea that in about October, I'll assess how much beef is left and we'll decide how much cow for the next year. As far as chickens go, I am no longer raising meat birds. So this year I will not raise the Cornish cross meat birds. I will raise American breasts instead. And I have the American breasts here. I will probably raise 20 for us. We are doing the poultry processing class and I'm actually working with another farm who raises the, the Cornish cross to provide the birds for that class. And the reason I'm doing that is people like how those birds taste. And a lot of people who take my poultry processing class, it's their first time. And they're used to more commercially produced birds. And so I thought, why not send them home with something that they'll like how it tastes? I don't know if they like the American breast. I think it's a far superior bird. In fact, it's the only chicken I actually like the flavor of. But I like dark meat. I like, you know, it's got a little bit of a firmer mouth feel. It's just a little bit different of an experience. And I'll probably sell those too as we raise them over time. So I think we'll raise just a little bit less because I'm not going to raise as many chickens as usual. And then the sheep are what they are, right? Like we're going to get fewer sheep this year than we had last year for processing. And that probably then next year I'll have another whole cycle of sheep that we're, we're harvesting. And that's because we, we produce some ewes that we're keeping in order to produce our sheep basically. Sheep are a little bit of a sore topic around here right now because they've been getting out, causing the redneck to be very upset with the sheep. And it's because our fence chargers from Premier have stopped working. And so we have another fence charger from another source on the way because we need the fence chargers to last more than a year. And we've been getting about a year out of the Premier ones. We'll let you know how that goes. Um, but it's just like when they don't get shocked on the regular, eventually somebody tests the fence and then they get out and that's caused a lot of extra work. And that paired with the, uh, that paired with the ice and snow and cold hasn't been fun. And 30 day reviews says always have a spare charger. We do. They're both broken. <laughs> They're both not working. That's, that's what caused some chagrin this week. It's like, well, the backup one doesn't work either. So, uh, we ordered one and we're just waiting for it to come. Apparently you need to have a spare two fence chargers. So if this one works, I'm going to be stoked and I'm going to be like, okay, let's buy another one. In fact, let's buy two more, even though it's expensive just to have them. 
you know, because it's really nice to have fence charges at work. Our next segment is the weekly shopping report from Joe. We have one this week. Uh, he was unable to get to the store during the ice storm. And then my schedule and his schedule did not match up, but they did this time. So here's what Joe has to say. He says, sorry for the hiatus. We were stuck behind eight inches of snow last week and did not get out. Good for you, Joe. I support the decision. The first rule of modern survival is survive. And if your roads are not passable and you do it anyway for no good reason, it's not an emergency, then you've made a terrible mistake. Anyway, we return to our usual routine Saturday plus a second trip. Dollar Tree was first. The drink coolers were in very bad shape with one of them fairly full, but the others empty or nearly empty. There were plenty of drinks on the shelves though. And I'll chalk it up to laziness. I stopped in here again on Sunday. Perhaps one of the empty ones had been refilled, but not the others. Home Depot was second on both days. A two by four by eight remains 325. We forgot it on Saturday. So I returned to Home Depot for a snow shovel. They just don't stock them. I did grab one of the few remaining bags of ice melt. I will order a snow shovel, rare or not, when we need it. Need it. That's actually something we're going to talk about on Friday. When I talk about getting rid of your garbage guys, but sometimes there's things you don't need very much, but when you need them a lot, like snow boots, you need them. Like I literally gave my snow boots. I'm going to talk about it now. I literally gave my snow boots side eye the other day when I was doing a great purge. Like I literally haven't worn these in two or three years. Do I need them? And I was like, mm, I'll keep them because when I need them, I really need them. And then it was so cold and I was so glad to have a pair of Sorrells uh, that I could wear that would keep my feet warm because Uggs don't do it. They just don't do it. Not in that kind of cold. Okay. Back to Home Depot. Two by four by eight is 325. Oh yeah. We already did that. So you know about the snow shovel too. Aldi was third on both days. They had no Maza in stock and Sonia uses it for birds who love it as well as for us. I asked someone today and she said it's a core item and should be on the next truck. We found everything else we wanted. Staple prices are as follows. Eggs, $1.66. I think that's up. Is that up? Whole milk, $2.93. Heavy cream, $4.69. Orange juice, $3.29. Butter, $3.69. Bacon, $4.29 with an asterisk. And potatoes, $3.99. Sugar, $3.09. Flour, $2.29. 80% lean beef, ground beef is $4.49. Although the prices of bacon had not changed, there was none of the low sodium variety and they added a couple of boxes of the cheap stuff, which was priced at $3.99. We just got regular bacon. Finally, I stopped for gas. A gallon of untainted regular has dropped to $3.63.9. Gas for me yesterday in Smithville, Tennessee was $2.79, which I thought was high, but that's just me. Next segment is frugality tip from Jed Froggy, who, if you don't know who that is, that means you're not on our Telegram cha channel. So you should totally go over there and join the Telegram channel where there's a great conversation going on all the time. It's at LFTN Group. That's LFTN for Living Free in Tennessee. During COVID, all Bob products were hard for me to find, especially pickle crisp. Upon researching and realizing that this is hydrated calcium chloride, I found some in stock at a home brewing supply. That supply line is obviously more robust. The container is larger and the larger container is cheaper than the little container of pickle crisp. Pickle crisp is just pearled calcium chloride. And this looks exactly the same. Despite pickle crisp becoming available, I've continued to shop over at the brewing supply store instead. While you're in there, price check other food grade chemicals and ask if you can leave your name as someone who wants waste mash. Waste mash is great for feeding your livestock, guys. So good, that's like a double frugality tip. One, you may be able to get waste mash for your livestock. Two, an like another way to get bulk calcium chloride. And I was talking about this the other day because cheese supply stores sell a liquid calcium chloride that's a 30% solution, which means 30% by weight of the powder to the other 70% by weight of water mixed together. That's what they sell. And it's like, six dollars for a container well you can buy a whole huge container of calcium chloride called pickle crisp at walmart right now for probably four dollars it might be more now and that makes tons that makes more that makes more cheese um 
calcium chloride liquid than you'll you'll need for a long time. Like that would la that lasts me more well more than five years worth. So it's just a better way to do it to mix your own, especially if you have a little bottle you can keep in it. And so I keep it in a mason jar because I keep lots of things in a mason jar. So this is like, that's next level cheap, right? So now he's going up even higher. Uh, he must use pickle crisp to crisp pickles. So he probably goes through more of it than I do in cheese making. Anyway, I thought that was great. Okay. Finally, we have Operation Independence, our last segment before the main topic of today's show. LFTN24 is sold out, my friends, and the wait list is up. So if you were kind of on the fence and didn't make up your mind and you're like, crap, I want to go, there's a waiting list. If somebody has something come up or cancels, I'll just reach out based on the, the order that people sign up for that. The link is in the show notes. Or if you go to livingfreeintennessee.com and click on workshop, if you click on the tickets, it'll take you to the ticket page. It'll say it's sold out. And there's like a link to that form as well. I also put a blog po post out on it on livingfreeintennessee.com. So that's there as well. Um, before I head into today's topic, I have one other question from the live audience. Do you have a cover over your aquaponics system? I cover it with plastic and I have like little hoops so that I can cover it with plastic. And I use dollar 25 tree shower curtains for that. So that's what I use. And I, then I weight down the outside edges and that's all I needed to keep my Swiss chard alive through the cold. And maybe Swiss chard stays alive anyway. Like my Brussels sprouts stayed alive and they were not covered. So I don't know. It could just be that they're hardy that low, but I was expecting them to get totally beat back because, you know, negative four degrees is hard on many, many plants in our area. Okay, it's time for the main topic of the show today. Should I do it? Should I do it? We ask ourselves this question a lot. And I was up at about five this morning and I sat with my coffee and I put an hour in on my My Three Things sales copy that I'm writing because the My Three Things book is in the process of getting edited and produced and all the things that need to happen with book, which is kind of a big lift. So then I, and then I did that because the sun was not up. So when I was done with my hour, the sun was up and I took the dogs for a walk. And then I did about a 30 minute set on housekeeping morning, you know, like whatever, clean, whatever, start, whatever, and evaluating my three things for the day. So by 7.30, I had done all of that and I was looking around and I glanced over at my sink and I saw last night's dishes drying in the sink. Okay. Well, I mean, they were dry because they'd been on there all night long in the put away rack or the drain rack. And I took a picture of it and I posted it up there and it kind of got me to thinking because during my housekeeping set this morning, which is not something I do every morning, but this like on Monday mornings in particular, I do because if I'm set up for sex set, ooh, set up for success out of the shoot, please just, just laugh about that one guys. If I'm set up for success out of the shoot, then I can make Monday happen. And Mondays and Tuesdays are my hardest days of the week, which is why when y'all ask me for appointments on Mondays and Tuesdays, I say no. Okay. So, um, if I don't get myself set up for success on Monday morning, first thing, then I still end up at choir because I got to have choir, but I get there and I haven't, like done, it seems like I haven't done half the things and it's the tiny littlest things that, that result in like big things mess, missed. So I frowned at the dishwasher during my 30 minute housekeeping set this morning because I knew it was full of clean dishes. I had run it right before I went to bed last night and I kept giving it side eye, but then I was like, but I got to sit down and do my, my, my three things paperwork that I do. And Often I'll do it on Sunday, but I, I was waiting till, uh, till Monday this time on purpose because I didn't know how far into the evening I would get on all the things I had still from the weekend. And then once, you know, things carry forward on that. And I just, then I was tired and didn't want to think about it. And I went to bed and that happens sometimes. 
I just, I do that sometimes. It's probably because I left the house yesterday. If I leave the house to do anything on Sunday, but go to the pool and swim laps, I get a little, a little out of sorts on my planning. But I got back on the train tracks this morning. And it was because I gave the dishwasher side eye because I know that we often put off time, like put off doing things like that. And we worry about it. And we talk about worrying about it. And we talk about why we can't do them right now. Only to discover when we do them. That it was not like you spent more time worrying about it, wasted more time worrying about it than it actually took to do the actual thing. And that's why the question comes up, should I do it? Because you look at that dishwasher, and you're like, should I do it? And the answer is like, hey, bonehead, it only takes 60 seconds to unload your dishwasher. So not, why not just do it? And then you're free for Then you don't have like dishes back up in your sink because they can go straight in the dishwasher. It's like a whole log jam is cleared. Even if you're running late to an appointment, that extra 60 seconds has lost all, all significance in the context of that running lateness because it's just one minute. And one minute, one way or the other, usually doesn't really matter when you're running late. It won't hurt you. I mean, it won't hurt you any more than running late was already hurting you. And that probably happened for a different reason. On the flip side, if I do 15 one minute tasks before I get the, out the door to that appointment, that could be the cause of why I was late. And that in fact is a problem. So you kind of got to be a little careful about should you do it or not? Because obviously the answer to should I unload my dishwasher is yes, but at what cost? At the cost of getting a dinner plan in place for the rest of the day so that I get out the door on time and, you know, having, stayed on plan and not gone off plan and all of the things that are important about having a homegrown home cooked meal. I often say spending 15 minutes at the beginning of the day in the morning, deciding what's for dinner and making sure you have what you need to make that happen on time is the difference between a nourishing home cooked meal and, and either eating that at 9 PM instead of 6 PM or just getting takeout which is a habit that's super easy to fall into. It's less easy to fall into if you live in a homestead really far from town, but we can still manage to make takeout happen, A. But it's easier when like literally you can walk out your door and four blocks away is a takeout place, right? So if you're lucky enough to be able to be practicing homegrown cooking, that 15 minutes at the beginning of the day, we're like, hmm, we're having taco salad. Do I have ground beef defrosted? Do I know what my chilies are going to be? Do I have all the spices I need? Where am I getting my greens from? What time do I have to start cooking that today? Okay, what's my appointment schedule look like? Oh, okay, good. I can cook it. Or nope, there's a call right then. So I either got to pre-cook it or I got to eat something else for dinner tonight. That time is one of the best investments at the beginning of the day for somebody who does from scratch living and homegrown cooking. So when and how then do you decide that that 15 minutes was more important than the 60 seconds to unload my dishwasher? When do I decide to do something versus like put that off for a time when I do a bunch of these little things at one time? And <laughs> Beth Emily says, I really need to take something out for dinner. Yes, go do that right now. It might be defrosted in time for you to cook it at this point. <laughs> the underlying problem here, guys, is that there are more to-do items than there are hours in the day. So when you look at yourself having to make these kinds of decisions, it's time to address the underlying problem, which is you've put too much on your to-do list. That doesn't mean don't strive for great things, but man, ask yourself why you are in the situation where you can't unload the dishwasher. I can tell you the reason I'm in that situation every freaking Monday is because I sing it. I've chosen that it is more important to me to sing in a choir than to have a smooth Monday. <laughs> so I just know it's a thing on Monday. And, uh, usually though, if you, if you say, okay, I have more things to do than there are hours in the day, you need to start 
examining that a little bit and ask yourself why. Is it because you've said yes to too many things? Guilty. I am so guilty of that. Is it the messy versus cleany problem? And by which I mean, we talked about messies and cleanies already once this month. Like messies tend to be more creative and starts lots of things and get super enthusiastic. And when they decide to, you know, eat organic food, they don't just go to the grocery store and buy organic food, more money, easy out. No, they're like, I have to know it's organic. Therefore, I'm going to have a garden. I'm going to, on my first year of my first garden ever, grow everything 100% organically, no pesticides, none of those crappy organic pesticides. Like I'm doing it all by hand. And, um, and then I'm going to take this food and I'm going to prepare it and I'm going to serve it. And I'm going to keep it on a rotation and like, holy cow, that got out of control fast, right? The book about messies versus cleaning, new messies manual. For, um, it's like the new messies manual for procrastinators on housekeeping. I have a link to that in the show notes in case you're interested in the book. This is a new edition than the one I read. I read it years ago, but it really talked about the difference between cleanies who will do things now to avoid pain later and messies who are like, I got to be so perfect that I, I take on way too much and then I end up where I end up. For me, there's a happy medium in between those two things because I, I call it doing things to make future Nicole happy. Future Nicole is going to be super happy when after this podcast, she's able to produce it in about 10 minutes because she already has the blog post ready to go and Libsyn post ready to go. And then all she has to do is produce the audio file, upload it and hit go. And it's done. I did that in the 10 minute space between having the reminder that this show was starting and the show starting where I was sitting in StreamYard watching y'all talk to each other before we started, right? Right, Hogs 14 and Beth Emily, you guys were there right before I jumped on. And I saw a couple of comments and I was like, I'm going to get these posts prepared so that I don't have to do it later. That space of time is super valuable. So <sighs> when you find yourself in a situation that you are more things to do than hours in the day, you need to figure out why. And it can be because you said yes too many times. It could be the, the overachiever issue the messy versus cleany. It could just be a period of time when you're just super busy. Like every April and October, I'm super busy. We're going to put that on crack this April because I have two events in the same month and they're both really important events and they both take an enormous amount of time. I just know it's coming. Fact that I know that it's coming now means that I can be like more prepared going in by having a backup plan for things. Bobby says, run the dishwasher at night, regardless if it's full in the morning, unload while waiting for coffee to brew. That's a really good thing. I actually often do that while I'm brewing coffee. Well, not while I'm brewing coffee, but while I'm drinking my coffee, my coffee takes 45 seconds to brew. So it brews faster than I can unload the dishwasher for me, but I will, you know, like I'll sit there and have coffee and walk around and poke at stuff too. So that's a really good one. We were taught in the seventies and eighties that you never want to run a dishwasher that's not full because the electricity would be too high. That, that was the lesson I got. So a lot of us will be like, Oh, there's room for two more dishes. I won't run it tonight. I'm with Bobby. I've learned to just run it. Not full. <laughs> if, if I'm going to use the dishwasher for that <laughs> anyway, so it could be an overly busy time or it could be that you you're not feeling great. So you're just not on your game. It could be that you don't have motivation to do the thing. And when you don't have motivation to do things, they stack up and then pretty much pretty soon you have more things than you can possibly do. Those are all reasons why, right? Well, yeah, but there's a deeper why. And that's why asking yourself like a three-year-old, why, but why, but why, why, but why, do why, do why, do why, you know, you've had this conversation before with a kid, right? 
You were that kid once. Why is the sky blue? Because light refracts, blah, 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 blah. Why does light refract? You know, like it goes on forever until your mom or dad explodes at you to shut up. Yeah. You need to do that to yourself as much as possible. At the core underlying place for me, it is usually because I haven't decided what the most important things are in, in the world around me or in what I'm doing. And when I haven't decided that, then everything's important. So now we're getting somewhere, right? To decide what is important, you have to decide what is not important. And then when all of those tiny decisions come up throughout the day about whatever, it's a very easy choice if you're going to do something, if you're going to do something now, if you're going to do something later, if you're not going to do it at all. Say it another way, and I like to say this a lot, is if everything's important, nothing's important. And that's a hard lesson to internalize sometimes because a lot of times when you look at things just initially, it is important. You know, how somebody feels is important or whatever. But when you really look at the hundred of important things in your life and, and give yourself 10, you quickly realize that a lot of things that feel important aren't really important. It's why I'm not obsessing about the border situation right now. Because I can do diddly and squat about it. And if it escalates in, into something that affects us, then, okay, then I'll probably start paying attention. I mean, like, I'm just situationally aware of that, right? I'm not, I'm not making any day-to-day -day decisions based on any of that, nor am I spending a lot of time looking at it in great detail. If I was a news reporter, though, that'd be super important to me and I would make time for it. So if you want to figure out what's really important to you, this is why I'm writing the My Three Things book, right? We, we talk about having a life strategic plan, your vision, your purpose, your goals. That goes, be, it goes beyond that though. For, you know, like I work from home, so I'm in the home all the time. And that means that there's overlap between home things and work things. And there's spaces where I fit home things in that you wouldn't have if you're at a day job because you're not home to do them. But for me, I need to have a home. Like my goal with my home is a home that empowers me and nourishing home-cooked food that we grow here. Because for me, the health part is really important in, in uh, my goals personally for longevity. And I have chosen to go the really messy route of actually raising much, much of our organically hand-grown food or sourcing it from people I know. And not everybody can do that, but I'm really lucky that I can. And I have spent years of my life dedicated to figuring out how that works into a home that empowers me. And when I say home that empowers me, like when it's cold outside and I need to gra grab a flannel shirt, I need a clean one to grab and I need to know where it is. Like it's a real simple thing, but it can be really hard if you get overcommitted and aren't keeping up with the things that need to be kept up with, whether you hire them out or do them yourselves. So when I looked at that, I was like, okay, well, how do you have a home that empowers you? Well, I know what it's like to have one that doesn't empower me because we ripped my whole house up over the fall. So this is like top of the brain. Like I'm, I'm viscerally connected with what bad looks like right now. Must haves for me. You got to have must haves and you got to have clarity on what's not important. And you can add some nice to haves. I usually don't have time for them. Other people do because other people are awesome. But must haves for me are systems that make it so I can find things and meals that happen on time most of the time. For me, any ideal that happens in a home that works for me is not going to happen all the time. It's just not. That's not how I work. Uh, <laughs> one of my items explains why. Space for hyper-focus mode. Tactical's been in hyper-focus mode whilst scattered for about three weeks right now. So we've been starting to talk about that. Because you got to make space for that. But if you stay there too long, it's a problem. And if your house is set up to constantly interrupt you when you're in hyper-focus, you also have a problem. 
and I need space to focus on my income earning endeavors. Like I got to roast coffee. It's going to take four hours. I need that four hours and I can't be unloading the dishwasher in the middle of it or else I'm off my game. And space to have some fun. I was just talking the other day, like I want to go on some backpacks soon out in the, out in the woods and, um, got to be able to leave to do that. We need to make sure our animals are cat like must have animals are cared for. Uh, my other must have is keeping up with the food growing projects. My garlic went in really late this year, but it went in, it went in and now it's time to start seedlings for the spring garden. And to do that, stuff has to happen. I haven't pulled down all the tomatoes from the tomato wall. I've decided not to do that yet, even though it will take me 25 minutes. Because it's less important than getting seedlings started, because I basically don't need them down, like, for sure, until it's time to put new tomatoes in. New tomatoes are going to go in in April. So I know all of that, and I make my decision as I can. But future Nicole would be really happy if I pulled those down and got rid of them. Right. So the minute I have a 25 minute thing where I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing with this 25 minutes. I'm probably going to go pull down the tomato vines and get rid of them so that we're ready to put the new tomatoes up on that thing. Um, proper supplies. This is why I care so much about pantry management. I needed barbecue sauce yesterday for some lamb ribs I made. And I walked out to the prepper pantry and I picked up a bottle of barbecue sauce. Yes, that's right. You heard it. Commercial barbecue sauce, like normal. I like normal barbecue sauce. I can make it from scratch. Haven't lately. So commercial barbecue sauce. Put it on the counter and serve dinner. That took 37 seconds to do. Had I walked out there and there was no barbecue sauce and then gotten in my car and driven to the store 25 miles away, bought a bottle of Barbecue sauce driven 25 minutes back after spending 15 minutes in the store. That would have been a huge waste of time. That is not a home that works for you, right? And I have to have not too much visual clutter. And I can tell you at this hot minute, we are not there because I'm still unpacking. But some clutter is okay with me. Other people can't have any. This is a, this is a, a gauge for you. Like it's a, you know, some people are further on the spectrum and other people are not as far on the spectrum in this one, but yeah, I need to have no, like very few household backlogs like laundry mountain. Laundry mountain is what happens when you are doing your laundry, doing your laundry, doing your laundry and dumping it on the couch to, to fold. And then you don't fold it. Or there's the other laundry mountain that's on the floor in your bedroom. For me, that turns into a dysfunctional situation where I can't find my flannel shirt when I need it. And I don't keep a lot of extra clothes. So, well, I have a lot of t-shirts right now, but I don't keep a lot of extra clothes because it just, it's a problem. <laughs> 30 day review calls it laundry gate. The systems have to work. And then food on time. And this is like, this is just specific to our household here. Food on time, most of the time from here. Things that are not important to me. It's not important to me. Is this a call out Jake episode? <laughs> oh, Survivalizer has Laundry Mountain right now. Yeah. You know what I had to do to get through my Laundry Mountain problem? I had to have dedicated space for dirty clothes. Dedicated space for the separated clothes for the, you know, lights versus darks. I don't do whites, lights, and darks. I just do lights and darks in the laundry room. And then I had to not mark laundry as done until it was folded and put away in the drawer. So when I committed to a load of laundry, I committed to I'm washing it, drying it, putting it away. And the only thing that makes that a little weird is I, I use a, a clothes rack, like European style clothes rack to dry my clothes most of the time. And that can take a day or that can take three days here. So sometimes the putting it away part does get stuck. But usually I get that all done. And by having fewer clothes, I have to get it done. So that's part like not having six pair of jeans means I can't go through, you know, I can't, I have to have jeans. So I got to get my laundry done. So it's got to be put away. So that's what did Laundry Mountain for me. I don't know if that would do it for you. 
but um, having less stuff really helps. Okay. So what's not important is having a museum clean house. And my mom maintains a museum clean house. She's very good at it. And it's, it's very important to her not to have visual clutter. Like she's a different place on the scale of that than I am. What I want is a functional house. And that's why this morning I put a picture of the dishes drying by in my sink and said, you know, this is like literally what it looks like. What I see here are stories. This is the story of dinner last night. Dinner last night was ribs. And I was also making bone broth for the week. So there's that. And I can see all of that and the hand ground spices that I cooked with. That's all there. And the fact that I put it there and went to bed instead of drying it all and putting it away and go to bed is fine. I got really great sleep last night. Those dishes are actually put away and there's a whole different set of dishes in that drying spot right now. My mom wouldn't let him sit there. Okay. So it's just for me, not important to have museum clean. Um, going out is not that important to me. I like to go out to a symphony or something from time to time, but I don't live my week so that I can go play paintball or go somewhere and do something, go shopping. Don't care. Just not, it's not important to me. It's more important to me to have the homestead lifestyle, to, to have home cooked food that we grow to live the way I'm living right now. Um, so that means that I don't go out, like I sacrifice going out to be able to do the things that I do here very often. Um, I'm not that into common entertainments like movies and all that and video games, like just doesn't like, these are sort of what people do. I don't do it really. I watch, I, we're watching the boys right now. Like this time of year, I'll watch a show at night because it gets dark so early. So we'll watch a show after dinner. But, um, I just, like if that went away, I wouldn't care. I'd be fine. I'll do something else. I'll spin wool. I'll read a book. I'll, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that I'd rather do. I'm not really into pointless hobbies. And by pointless hobbies, I mean, spinning wool is a hobby, but it produces something. I'm not as into like collecting rocks, even though that can be turned into something useful too. Um, it's just, not, I don't do hobbies to, just to do hobbies, I guess, to pass the time. It's not my thing. Not important to me at all. Um, you know what else is not important to me? And this might be important to you. I don't have to have the same schedule or the same thing every day. In fact, it I would say a must have is I can't have the same thing every day, same schedule every day. It makes me crazy. And that means that I set things up here so that that does not have to happen. And then the other thing that's not that important to me is decor, decorations. Sure, I had fun putting a Christmas tree up this Christmas. Sure, I have some cool things hanging on my walls. But a lot of my decorations serve a purpose. Useful versus pretty, right? You know, my spinning wheel makes a really nice little decoration in my living room. <laughs> it's a useful thing. And I have a painting up above my, on my wall that I love, but a lot of times the things that are decorating, it, it'll be like a pretty wine carafe in case I ever needed to decant or decant or in case I need to decant wine, but it's, it's, it's my sculpture, right? I like things that serve a purpose. And of course, you know, I like them to look good, but I don't just buy tchotchkes to, to have a visual thing. So that being said, a non-healthy environment in my home does not meet my needs at all. So it must be healthy. This is why it's not really acceptable for me to leave a big pile of dishes in the sink for days on end starting to stink, right? If that's not healthy. But I don't need museum clean. And that's important to know because whether or not to unload the dishwasher at that minute is influenced by that. And sometimes I need to go roast the coffee right then. So I think when you've got clarity on those things, you can say, okay, but when should I do something? Like, when do I actually do the things that I need to do? And the answer is back to the dishwasher. Mine didn't get emptied till lunchtime today. You want to know why? Because I like having clean clothing and I needed to do laundry. And in order to have healthy food tonight, 
I had to have a plan in place and I had to make sure I had everything ready to go. And I also had an 8 a.m. call, so I couldn't just go over the eight o'clock mark and get another couple of things done, which would have been fine any other day. I needed to do the most important things first. And the cool thing about laundry is you can start the laundry and then it runs itself until later when you move the laundry to the dryer or hang the laundry on the rack, rack right? Um, and I only had 30 minutes for the household stuff. There were other things that were much more important. And it was important to me to get exercise in the form of walking my dogs. And it was important for me to spend that hour on the book project because otherwise the book won't get out. So I made that decision that laundry takes time, so I'll get it done and little other action. I better start it and get it all separated and all those things. Dinner had to happen at 5 p.m., which is one hour earlier than usual. And I made sure I had everything in place for taco salad night, which includes harvesting Swiss chard. And it had to be built into my day. And as I said, Monday's a really important day here. It's a really hard day here. Um, we have a meeting every Monday. Tactical and I do. Talking about what we're doing this week and what the schedule is and who's doing what on which day and who needs the car. And that guy had to get knocked out too in that 30 minutes. So by the time that was all done, it was 7.59 and, th and you know three quarters. And I didn't have time left to unload the stupid dishwasher. So I just gave it side eye for the rest of the morning while I hyper focused on work until it was time to cook lunch. And then in that magic moment, when I was cooking lunch, the one minute dishwasher unload finally freaking happened. Now people say women can multitask and that is not how I look at it. I rapidly task is what I do. I fill the spaces or the breaks with small things like unloading the dishwasher. While I wait for other things to happen that are not ready for my next input. That's not multitasking. That's rapidly changing from thing to thing to thing to thing and back to the other thing. And the way I got the dishwasher unloaded is while waiting for the onions to caramelize today when I was cooking them, which takes four minutes. I unloaded the dishwasher, which takes one minute. I had three minutes left. So the dishwasher was the perfect thing to add in that space. And it's those spaces that make the difference between keeping up on stuff and ending up way behind. If when you're caramelizing the onions, you stare at the onions the whole time for four minutes, you've wasted probably three, two or three of those minutes when you could have been doing something else. So you could have been wiping the counter, you could have been unloading the dishwasher. You don't wanna to go too far because then you're gonna burn the onions, but there's a space there. Likewise, when you throw a casserole in the oven for 45 minutes, like, do you watch it? No, you set the timer and you go do something else while that's happening. Maybe you make the salad that goes with it. Maybe you're done cooking until it comes out. Maybe you set the table, right? It's those spaces that matter. When you're purposeful with the spaces, that's how you decide when you're going to do it. And when you don't have those spaces, then the answer is obviously no. Because then you move everything else around and it has a cascading effect and you end up really messed up. And I know it sounds like a bit of like crazy torture, this filling of spaces, thinking like you'll never get a break, like you never stop working. No, here's what happens when you do this. If you spill the, fill those spaces right, you have less to do at the end of the day because you have less backlog from the, the little things that need to be done. And you get at work, if you do it at work, you get more forward momentum on projects. Like for example, my 10 minute space between being reminded I have this show at two and starting the show at two, I got all of my production that I could get done for this show done in advance, which means the show will go out faster, which is great because I got to get out of here today because it's a choir day. And I think it gives you a healthier outlook because when you fill those tiny spaces, you make bigger ones for rest, re rejuvenation, or for other projects that you actually want, like need to concentrate on. Right. And I know you guys listen to me because I'm like, why haven't you done it yet? Why haven't you done it yet? And 
why you, and you're probably expecting me to say like, why you should always choose to do it. No, I don't think so. I think it's really quite the opposite. You need to think about what is important that you actually do and then how you're going to get it done. And sometimes that looks like not you doing it. That's an important question to ask. What can I spend the time figuring out how to delegate this? That actually might be worth it. Might be worth it. I was just thinking about that today, how these little domestic tweener projects are foundational to the functioning of the Holler homestead. And it goes way beyond homesteading because when you have those tweener projects happen during your day at work, if you're an at work person, you'll get more done at work, take less home with you. That's kind of cool. Then you can do your home stuff when you're home, if you have a job. And I can tell you this, even though I don't go to a job, I do have job times of the day and I have non-job times of the day because when I'm in my work mood, there's always important little maintenance things related to work. Um, when I'm sitting around waiting 10 minutes or 15 minutes, afraid I'm going to miss something. Here's one that gets me. Google Calendar, which is what I use to keep my appointments. I know somebody's screaming right now about Google. But anyway, it'll give me a reminder 10 minutes before the appointment, which is why I sat down at the desk 10 minutes before the appointment and did the production. And then if it does not give me a reminder that I'm actually starting, if I go off and sweep the roasting shack in that 10 minutes, which I totally have time to do, or start working on an email to somebody or on the LFTN like event email that's going out this week or whatever it is, and I don't have that second reminder, I miss the appointment. And that is the why of not doing a thing. If that's your why, fix the stupid reminder program. Don't just waste that 10 minutes of time. In my house, I managed to fill, fit that 60 second onion thing in while the onions were cooking. Why? Because I can tell at a glance if the onions need stirring. <laughs> that's it. And so I know I'm going to be successful at getting the onions done and the dishwasher unloaded. Even if I'm halfway through the dishwasher, I'm like, oh, stir. Okay, back to the dishwasher, right? But that call, that call that I'm getting the reminder for, the call is a different thing altogether. If I wander off and do a five-minute sweep of the shack while waiting that 10-minute period of time for a reminder to call, I may not make that call. Because I may get into the roasting shack and then I'll see something else and I'll see something else and I'll forget about the call. And the fix to this is a second notification. If you set your calendar default to have the second notification that is like, oh, by the way, your call is actually now starting, then you can take your 10 minute warning, identify, ah, oh, I have an opportunity here. I have a 10 minute space of time that I can do a tweener project in, get that tweener project done. And then I won't have that one day where it's all tweener projects. That makes that space usable again in your schedule. It's a simple fix. It works and it gives you back 10 lost minutes that you were going to add to your afternoon focus project where you're coming up with a new script idea or whatever it is. It's a powerful gift. You do three of those, you get half an hour, man. Half an hour is a lot. So... Asking the question is the first step. Building purpose into your answer is the second step. And if you don't take both steps, you can't take the third step, which is executing on the whole thing. So here's to a sink full of clean, drying dishes, a dishwasher that's unloaded, a dinner that cooked itself while I ate my lunch, and being purposeful about if you're going to do something or not. So should you do it? The answer is it depends, right? It depends on you choosing the actual big picture priorities in your life. Like I talk about in my book, My Three Things. It depends on if you have set up to make yourself to get the most important things done to you for your life, for your project, rather than having somebody else control where you focus, right? The question to, to should you do it is the permaculture, it depends. 
If you like the show and want to support the work I'm doing here, you can do it in two ways. One, get your coffee at hollerose.com. Two, consider becoming a member. Head over to livingfreeintennessee.com to find out more. And we will see you tomorrow for the 1230 Live. With that, guys, go out. Make